Hello everyone, how are we doing today? And welcome to today's video. So now we are entering chapter three in genetics and I'm breaking this up into four parts and then adding two more videos going over example problems. So four parts in this one and then two example problem videos. So it's a long chapter. So this goes back over Mendelian genetics. So we'll be doing Punnett squares. We'll be taking them one step further, going into branch diagrams and then doing some chi-square analysis. So we're going to be get, getting into our first math of the course. But first, we got to go over some important concepts and terms before we even think about drawing a Punnett square because we have to properly describe everything and figure out the questions. So this first video here, I decided to just make it on some of the important terms and concepts in heredity. So we have some different types of genetics we talk about when we're going through the semester. The first type is you know, classical Mendelian genetics, and that's what the focus of this chapter is. So here, just as a reminder, so a section of DNA that codes for a character. Here, I want to define what a character is. So first here, the section of the DNA that codes for a character, of course, that is called a gene. So if you have a section of DNA, you know, here are the base pairs coming down through, and you have a region in here, this, this codes for a particular gene. So this is a gene, but it codes for a character. So a character is, so if we're talking about, so pea plants is the one we always talk about here. So pea plants, you can have um, seed shape. So seed shape would be the character. The trait, which is the next thing down here, could be round or wrinkled. So there's a difference between character and a trait. So here's the trait, whereas here is the character. So the character is seed shape. This gene codes for seed shape. That seed shape can either end up being round or wrinkled. So one form of gene that codes for one form of the trait, that is called an allele. So we'd say the allele for round seed shape is the trait, or the allele for wrinkled seed shape is the trait whereas seed shape is the character. So just make sure you don't uh, screw up those terms. So how do we get round or wrinkled? Remember, all of these genes are located on chromosomes. So remember right here would be the gene or the character for seed shape. Let's say we have a dominant form and a recessive form. Here, the dominant form would code for round seeds and the recessive form would code for wrinkled seeds. We'll explain a little bit how that might work in terms of seed shape here coming up. So then, as I just said, there's a dominant and a recessive form. And we're going to actually go into Mendel's work in the next video showing how he, he actually used the phrase, one is dominant, one is recessive. So the one that's always expressed is dominant. So if this was our um, allele combination here, it would be round. You would not know that recessive one is there. You would not know the wrinkled gene or the wrinkled allele was hiding in there because the round one would dominate. So that's why it's called dominant versus the recessive one, which is masked by the dominant alleles. So like this example right here. So how does this work molecularly? So, you know, what do these alleles code for, genes code for? Typically they code for enzymes. So let's do an example here of the SBE1 gene, which is what causes round versus wrinkled seeds. So if we're looking at this one, uh, let's say we have the dominant form, you know, capital A is how we recognize that. What this does is it codes for an enzyme. So that enzyme, so that SBE1 enzyme, causes starch to branch. So starch branches. So then that creates round seeds because that branching of starch helps that seed retain water under specific conditions. Whereas if we only have the recessive version here, what this does is, you know, no enzyme. I mean, it still could code for the enzyme, but the enzyme wouldn't function properly. It's called LOF or loss of function. So what happens here is starch doesn't branch. And when starch doesn't branch, so we have linear starch in there, that seed can lose water and that's what causes it to be wrinkled. So that's you know how this works. So if you have the combination here of one chromosomal combination, so member one is from the father and the other is from the mother, say this was the combination, 
This one would still produce the enzyme, hence it'd be still round. This one would still be expressed, it just wouldn't be producing a proper enzyme. Uh, so the only way to get recessive is if you have two recessive alleles present. Uh, so that's the significance here of what I wanted to talk about, the molecular nature. And something simple that we're talking about, round versus wrinkled peas, actually has some molecular biology significance to it. All right, so moving on now, different ways we can you know, notate alleles. Just a little bit about notation here because these do come up in different questions. The ones we've been using all this time so far, one letter, of course, where you know capital is dominant and A is recessive. Uh, next form here are multiple letters. So for multiple letters, some examples, HL, AZH, or CW. So here, there might be some variability in the traits. There might be one where there's a little bit of blending going on, where there's some incomplete dominance. So you use multiple letters to describe the trait in a little bit more detail, whereas a full dominant or recessive doesn't really define it enough. And we'll, throughout the course, we will get through a couple of these examples. Uh, next one is sub or superscripts. Examples of these include, you know, LFR1, uh, LFR2. We'll talk about these ones later uh, in the course, that is. Uh, some other examples you could have, you know, superscripts, RB versus RW. Uh, so we'll see those coming up sometimes. We talk about those with flower color as well. Uh, and then the other one I want to talk about is wild type because that gets a unique designation. So when we talk about wild type, usually we're referring to Drosophila, um, mice, things like that, uh, worms. But you know we're going to hit it first in the semester talking about Drosophila. So Drosophila, what we do is for these wild types, a so wild type is what you find in the wild. And then the one that has the recessive form or the one that has the genetic difference or the change is called the mutant. Don't think of it as like something you know crazy mutant looking. It's just you know the recessive trait. It's like calling a wrinkled pea the mutant. So we designate these with plus signs for the wild type. So let's say we're looking at, you know, an example here for yellow. Uh, so here, uh, well, first the designation, you do a letter with the plus sign or just a plus sign. So here, if we're looking at, you know, a yellow trait on a wild type, we can write that as Y-E plus or just plus. Whereas on the mutant, you don't have the plus, it'd just be Y-E for each of these. So just wanted to designate that. We will get into these ones um, a little bit later. So this would be for you know, something like a yellow-eyed fly mutant. So this part here is a little reminder of something we've already talked about. So allele combination in a cell or organism. So we're talking, you know, this co these combinations right here. Those are called the genotype. Remember the genotype? is the actual genes that are there. It's a type of genes that are present. And now we don't have to say big A, little A, big A, big A anymore. Now we're finally going to properly define these. So if they're the same allele, so true breeders are also called homozygotes here. These are called homozygous. So these are very important terms to know because when I ask you questions, I'll be like, okay, we have a homozygous dominant individual crossed with this. You have to know to write the proper letter. So you can be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. And then the other option down here is if you have two different alleles. This is called heterozygous. So zygous is zygote. Hetero is different. Different zygote. Same zygote for homozygous. So now I won't be saying big A, little A. I'll be saying heterozygous or homozygous dominant or recessive. And there, there are a couple different notations you can use to write the alleles. We have the classic way, of course. Um, you know, heterozygous here for two traits because we're going to be getting into dihybrid crosses. So for two traits, you write it like this. So this would be the second trait. This would be the first trait. Don't make the mistake of writing all the dominants together and uh, flipping the letters around. You won't be able to read that at the end then. So don't. Don't write it like that. Make sure you keep the alleles for that particular character grouped together. Another way you can write these are with slashes. So with slashes, you separate the alleles, not the characters. So you know, if this was the heterozygous one, you might ask, why are you doing that? Because look at an example up here for yellow. Um, it's Y-E. Is that one Y and then another character is E? 
So here you put a slash to make sure you know that's one unit. Uh, so then, so here like plus slash ye is how you'd write a wild type with a mutant. A little bit easier to understand. And then for two, it's uh, same thing. So just a slash b and then b, no, oh, eh, a slash a and b slash b. So it's a little harder to write that, but you could see how it could work better for something like uh, the Drosophila. Any other notations? If you don't know whether it's heterozygous or homozygous dominant. So if I give you an example problem, I'm like, okay, which one of these is it? How do you write that? It, you'll see it written as a underscore where that underscore could be recessive or dominant. So you don't know what that is. If I just tell you the P is round, you cannot tell me if it's heterozygous or homozygous dominant, unless you do something that we'll talk about later. <clears throat> Coming up right down here. And then here, the physical trait, like round versus wrinkled that you see is the phenotype. So make sure you don't screw up phenotype versus genotype. So remember phenotype, physical trait encoded by the gene. So that's round or wrinkled. Again, it's what you see in the phenotype doesn't always give you the genotype. So now how do we do this Mendelian stuff? We do crosses. Uh, so a cross is a controlled reproduction between individuals. So if we're looking at, you know, the typical Mendelian cross here, let's say we're crossing, you know, this is our cross. We de designate that with a little X in between. So typical Mendelian crosses here. First you have the parent. So you de designate that as P. So here would be the cross. So parents are usually true breeders and they meaning cross with themselves. They always produce that. So round with round always produces round wrinkled with wrinkled always produce wrinkled. So you do this cross and you get the first generation here. These are oops, not P. Uh, these are all called the F1 generation or first filial. So Mendel got all of that and then did a self cross within that generation. So it was an F1 cross another F1, and then you got the F2 generation. So these are all progeny or offspring, and this is second filial. So just these are important to note. So uh, so parent cross, F1 cross, and then you could even do F2 crosses to produce an F3 as well. And every now and then with these crosses, when you're testing something, you might do a back cross, which is when you take one of these F1 individuals and cross it with a parent. That's F1 cross a parent. Another option is when you do selfing. So selfing is when you take one cross with itself. Um, so you see with the individual. Next one here is a reciprocal cross. Now this is one we're gonna get into later when we talk about sex linked traits next chapter. But here is when you have, you, you mix up the sexes for the next cross. So you compare two. So let's say we have a female purple flower and we're crossing it with a male white flower. You'd also compare that to a female white flower cross a male purple. You might ask, why would you do that? It's because it'll help you define uh, sex linked traits. And we'll get into that in a later chapter. That's not uh, Mendelian test stuff quite yet. And then the last thing we do here is a test cross. Remember when I had that, you know, underscore there, we didn't know what that is. Well, we can figure out what that is by crossing it with a homozygous recessive individual. So if you do this cross and get any recessive, uh, traits, you know this was heterozygous. If you do this cross and they were all the same phenotype, the dominant trait, you know homozygous dominant. So this is just you know an introductory to this chapter. I wanted to go over some important terminology that we'll be using throughout the chapter and future chapters coming up. Hope you learned a little bit today. We will be using all this again in the future as we go through this in more detail, but that's all I have for today. Hope you learned a little bit, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.